how much of that increase in lifespan compared to the standard American is driven by body fat? So BMI or body fat percentage. You know, I had Professor Roy Taylor on recently. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work, but he does a lot of research on type 2 diabetes. And he spoke of this idea of energy toxicity. So people um, putting on fat and then based on genetics, we have a kind of different threshold uh, by which we can store fat subcutaneously and at different points depending on the individual when fat starts to begin to get stored in the liver and in the pancreas we can see these metabolic conditions like type 2 diabetes or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and that kind of got me thinking i think 70 percent of american adults are either overweight or obese and i was curious what's What's the Adventist population look like? What what percentage of them are overweight and obese? And, and how much do we think their body weight is determining, influencing these you know better health outcomes that we see? Yeah. Um, well, the um, it's very interesting to compare vegans, which are those that eat no animal products at all and are about 10% of our group, Lacto-over-vegetarians, people who eat dairy and eggs but no flesh foods. Pesco-vegetarians, those that eat fish but no other flesh foods and are otherwise like lacto-over-vegetarians and non-vegetarians. And it turns out if you look at BMI that our vegans, our strict vegetarians, are averaging about 23.8 where 25 starts to be called overweight. Uh, our PESCOs and lacto-ovos are right up around averaging about 25, which means that about half of them are actually overweight, half of them are not. Now, non-vegetarians, their BMI is averaging about 28, uh, even though, as you pointed out, they're really only eating flesh foods about three, three and a half times a week. So they're a pretty health-conscious population, but they're Americans, I'm afraid, and we eat too much in terms of portion size, um, and make choices even amongst vegetable foods, vegetarian foods, which are not ideal sometimes, uh, a lot of processed uh, foods. Um, in terms of to what extent body fat makes a difference, or BMI, we, in the same paper that we analyzed that those extra seven to 12 years of life we just talked about, we did find that there were five factors we could identify that each roughly contributed potentially about two years of extra life. And uh, they were actually some I mentioned before, uh, being a vegetarian or not, um, being careful with your body weight, which was another, um, vigorous activity, physical activity, small quantities of nuts, and never having been a smoker. Roughly speaking, each of those independently contribute about two years of life. So as an independent factor, the BMI seemed to be in that two years range, but it's kind of tied up, isn't it, with being a vegetarian or not? Because it turns out that vegetarians have a, a lot to do with whether they're overweight or not, whether you're a vegetarian. Uh, it's tied up with physical activity. So these things, it's a little hard to dissect them out, but having to look for an independent effect of body weight, uh, we seem to be looking at about two years. Mm -hmm. and, and the kind of reverse of what you're saying there is that that analysis allows you to look at the independent effect of a vegetarian diet on mortality minus its influence on body weight. And nut consumption. And nut consumption. That's right. When you say small quantities of nut right. consumption, what does that mean? A uh, small handful. All right. Do you have a go to a go to nut that you enjoy most, or you like the nutritional properties oh, yeah, of yeah, most? So, so you know, to, just to be clear, we're certainly not talking about having a bucket of nuts in front of the TV. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, nuts are actually a great food because you can put them, you can use them in so many ways in your diet. I actually choose to sprinkle mine on my cereal in the morning, but you can put them in salads. You can put them in a variety of entrees. Uh, so, you know, you can use them in so many ways, actually. Um, very flexible. Yeah. yeah. My go-tos mm -hmm. tend to be walnuts and macadamias. Right. 
and um, they are, most of the nuts are not botanically related, actually. I think pecans and walnut are an exception to that. But um, walnuts have a lot of polyunsaturated fat, and they also have a moderate amount of omega-3, linolenic acid. So they're a bit different to the others. Uh, most of the others are high in monounsaturated fat, including peanuts, which of course are botanically uh, uh, a legume, but they seem to have a lot of the same nutritional qualities uh, as other nuts, actually. And is it the monounsaturated fats or the polyunsaturated fats or both that you think are beneficial from a cardiovascular point of view? Probably, probably more so the mono, the uh, polyunsaturated fats in the sense that they lower cholesterol. The uh, monounsaturated fat is largely oleic acid, and it seems to be more neutral, but it's certainly better if you substitute it for saturated fat, you see. Quick one, folks. I get asked all the time about buying supplements and getting blood tests. The good news is I've created comprehensive and completely free guides for both. Simply head over to my website, theproof.com, to download them. That's theproof.com. Okay, let's get back to the episode. You mentioned that there's this kind of stepwise increase in BMI as you go from a vegan to a lacto-ovo vegetarian to a pesco vegetarian to a semi-vegetarian to a, to a non-vegetarian. And one of the things that kind of comes to mind is that you know, BMI can also be heavily influenced by muscle mass. And some people might be curious as to whether there's been any attempt at looking at this cohort and seeing, is that increase in BMI because, you know, as people are eating more animal foods, they have more body fat? Or is it because they have uh, more muscle mass, more bone mass, et cetera? Um, we've actually got some data on that, we got some uh, body composition um, data using bioimpedance, but we've never really looked at it. We've never had a chance. It was only on a subgroup of our population, so we don't have an answer to that. Um, but I don't think there's any evidence that animal foods tend to increase muscle mass. Um, yeah, I think there's there's a a group out there who would argue that a vegan diet being lower in protein and say calcium might lead to increased risk of sarcopenia or low bone mineral density these might be the limitations of such a dietary framework that people might point out and say these are things that you would want to be aware of um, and that that combination of reduced muscle mass and uh, lower uh, bone mineral density, and I'm not saying that that's been confirmed in your population, but this is the view that I think someone would table right now would would increase frailty and risk of of fracture. Have those outcomes been looked at? Uh, yes, they have, and I, I think there is some increased risk of um, lower bone density in very strict vegetarians. Um, but we have looked at that, and it turns out that the best ways to avoid osteoporosis, and it's not only our data, uh, really have not a lot to do with calcium, for instance, unless you're really calcium deficient, which the vegans are not. You can get all kinds of calcium from uh, vegetarian foods. Uh, I mean, we've looked at it. We've got data on it. The vegetarians are not calcium deficient at all. Uh, they tend not to be much pro lower in protein either because, I mean, there's no shortage of ways of getting protein uh, with a vegan diet. It's not just lettuce, leaves, and carrots, you know. It's um, nuts and legumes and whole grains. And uh, the population as a whole probably gets more protein than they need. Um, so the, the idea that vegans... Uh, suffer from sarcopenia, I don't know that our data would support that. Um, we don't see that, and we have the largest study of vegans in the world. I mean, uh, the other thing, that, there are actually two items that our data suggested were preventive of osteoporosis and bone fractures. Uh, one was regular vigorous physical activity which has nothing to do with 
diet or being a vegan. The other was getting adequate protein. And interestingly, we were able to look at that separately in the vegetarians and the non-vegetarians. And either way was effective. In other words, animal protein and vegetable protein had the same apparent impact in terms of being associated with uh, you know, bone fractures. So, um, uh, you know, I, I guess I haven't seen the convincing evidence about uh, what you're saying. What is you know? the, the mm -hmm. protein intake within the Adventist cohort and how, does, how much does it differ between the vegans and the non-vegetarians? Very little, actually. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's in the 70 gram range, which is, you know, well within uh, what's generally considered to be sufficient and uh, very little. So that would yeah. fall kind of just above one gram per kilogram, probably based on the average body weight. I'm assuming yes. of yeah, of, of these yeah. people. Um, yeah, there's a there's a, an interesting meta analysis by Tangawa. I think it is. I'll put it into the show notes for people to look at. But it speaks to what you just said then. But this was looking at how does increasing protein consumption affect strength in two different contexts. One is without physical activity and one is with physical activity. And when you look at without physical activity, it really doesn't do much at all. You can increase your protein intake if if the stimulus isn't there, the body's not adapting. I think most people um, can can understand and comprehend that. The other context where there is physical activity what was interesting was most of the increase in strength comes with about 1.1, 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram, which is probably not far off where the Adventists are at. And so you know, online and in media, you'll see a lot of focus on protein and consuming high protein. But that going from where the average protein intake is today to, say, high was like squeezing the last few drops out. Of the, of the towel when it came to strength, um, which says to me that if we look at sarcopenia today, just across the United States, and you look at the average protein intake, I would argue that most of the, the loss of muscle mass and quality is because people are sedentary and the stimulus isn't there. It's, you know, if, if they had that stimulus there, they have more than enough protein to, to adapt and to, to stay strong as they're aging. Yeah. No, I, I think I'd agree with you uh, wholeheartedly there. And, uh, you know, one, one of the, I think, kind of myths that's around is that as you get older, you should have packed on a few more pounds. Um, and uh, our data doesn't support that. Uh, the other word, in other words, the idea that people that have, once they get into their 70s and 80s, that have a little higher BMI, for instance, which is probably not protein mass, uh, I mean muscle mass, but, um, but our data doesn't support that. Uh, we find that having a BMI in the 23, 25 range for both men and for women gives you the lowest mortality at all ages, right through to, to the old ages. And the, you know, the, there's a possible reason for that that is a little complex, but it turns out that um, in most average populations, and to some extent in the Adventist population too, but probably less so, people that are in that average range of BMI, kind of around the 25, as they get older, uh, many times people who used to be much higher, 28, 30, but because they've got chronic disease have slipped back to be 25. So using that as a reference point has now become confounded and confused, whereas with the Adventists who are in that middle range or even a little bit lighter, they're often then not because of chronic disease, because of the way that they've uh, lived their life. So, so our data for both, interestingly, in black subjects and white subjects separately gives uh, really, um, I think, the light of that, that it's not really true. Mm -hmm.